Hi, I'm Brad, and here's what's going on at Lakeside. We have one week left of putting put in the pantry, helping Lake Springfield Christian Assembly stock up on large cans of chocolate pudding for summer camp. LSEA uses the chocolate pudding for their Oreo fluff dessert, a favorite among the campers. You can help by going to lakesidechristian.com give and select special offering, or you can place your gift in the receptacle located near the display in the entry. If you're newer to Lakeside, then the starting point meal is for you. The next starting point is on Sunday, May 22nd at 1145, immediately following our second service. Find out more about Lakeside's ministry and mission, meet our staff, and enjoy a delicious lunch. You can register for starting point at lakesidechristian.com slash events. We hope to see you for lunch on May 22nd. Today, we're in our third week of our teaching series, Reset. Follow along in your Reset guidebook to take message notes and to use the spiritual discipline practices throughout the week. You can catch up on all the messages from the series and all of our services at lakesidechristian.com slash on demand. Today's Mother's Day. It's a special day. And we want to offer a special welcome to all of our mothers. We want to honor and say thank you for all that you do. So stop by the photo booth and get a picture. And we invite all of our ladies to enjoy a special treat with us today. Happy Mother's Day. I want to welcome you to worship this morning. Would you take a moment and go to trylakeside.com and check in. It's a brief online form that lets us know you worshiped with us this morning. You can leave a prayer request, ask a question, or ask to speak with a pastor. Would you please stand as we begin our service today? Let's worship. I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the, and the four living beings. And they fell before the throne with their faces to the ground and worshiped God. They sang, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. Jesus, let your kingdom come here. Let your will be done here in us. Jesus, there is no one greater. You alone are Savior. Show the world your love. heaven come now king of heaven come now let your glory reign shining like the day king of heaven come king of heaven rise up who can stand against us you are strong to save in your mighty name King of heaven, come. We are children of your mercy. Rescue for your glory. We cry, Jesus, set our hearts towards you. And every eye will see.
God, Father, whose Son, Jesus, is the good shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads, who, with you and the Holy Spirit, lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Before being seated and we move into the message, would you please greet one another around you?
ever wish you had a reset button? What would a reset look like in your life? We've all experienced disruptive changes, profound loss, abnormalities, been on the brink of burnout. We want to offer you hope, encouragement, guidance. God promises life and life everlasting. Good morning, everyone. I'm sure you've heard it already. Happy Mother's Day uh, to you mothers out there. This is one of those days where every single one of us uh, has a special person for whom to thank God. We all came from mothers, so uh, we can thank God for the gift of mothers. My mom, uh, is her name's Rosemary, and she watches online every week. And uh, she even throws like a little watch party, you know, just to kind of rally support. And she gives me a report every week of how many were in attendance for her online audience. So she's quite the promoter. So uh, so mom, if you're watching, happy Mother's Day. And if you're not watching, why are you doing me like that? You know, but anyway. Uh, but, uh, but to all of you mothers, we really appreciate you. And uh, we thank you for being here this morning. And I hope some of what we share this morning will be an encouragement to everyone, and especially to mothers. Uh, for the fast, uh, last few weeks, we uh, have begun a new series that we've been calling Reset. And we've been entertaining this idea of how God has promised that if we're willing to repent and really turn back to God, and if we're willing to trust his word, if we're willing to peer deep into the face of Jesus, who is God in the flesh and who made God known to us, uh, if we could just get like a full-eyed view of God's mercies and his love and and his faithfulness, all these things, you know, God would refresh us, and he does. And when you come to church, you see a lot of refreshed people. Uh, You'll see people that aren't refreshed, that are just beginning the journey, but you'll see so much joy and so much peace, and not that people's lives are perfect, but there's a, a, a way in which God refreshes his people and resets us and gives us uh, just a, a, his life through his spirit, and that's a very powerful thing. Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to talk about how God resets our inner life by his Holy Spirit. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to talk about how God resets our outer life, like our character and our conduct. Uh, how does he do that by his Holy Spirit? And in a couple of weeks, we're going to come back to the theme of family, and we're going to talk about how God resets our families. And then how he resets our church. So we're just going to go through some different areas of our lives where God hits that reset button with us. Years ago, I was a huge fan of the dog whisperer. Anybody uh, watch the dog whisperer? Really? Like, I don't think anybody raised their hand. Uh, anybody watch the cat whisperer on TV? You know, nobody whispers cats. Cats whisper you. You know, it's back, you know, there's no cat whisperer on TV. But I... Uh, but if you, if you ever watch, you know, Caesar, whenever there's an unruly dog, you know, maybe it's a dog that's depressed and sad. Anybody have a depressed and sad dog? Uh, maybe it's a dog that's high energy and neurotic and ultra hyper and never settles down. We got a, a new schnauzer uh, in our household, and that's how he is. But uh, maybe your dog's overly friendly and doesn't have any boundaries and uh, whatnot. Maybe your dog, you have a dog that's dangerous. And it lashes out because of pain or fear. You know, maybe you have a dog that has all those conditions. I don't know. But I love this show because people make excuses for their dogs about their bad behavior. And there's always a story. There's a human story that gets told and spoken over a dog's life. The puppy had a bad life. You know, this one was abused. Uh, This one was abandoned. This one had come from a house where children tormented. Laura got a schnauzer as a kid that had a crooked tail because the little kids had run over the tail with a hot wheel, you know, so anyway, the dog wasn't very nice all the time, but, uh, but it loved me, and that's how I got in to be, you know, with Lars, like, if the dog likes him, he can, you can date him, if it doesn't like him, he's gone, but anyway, I got along, I need to get along with the dog, but, uh, but it's interesting with Caesar, because within, like, seconds, often, with the owner even standing there next to him, Caesar can transform a dog's behavior. And uh, I've tried all of Caesar's tricks at our house. And the softer I whisper, the louder the dogs bark. They're like, you're a fraud, you know, but anyway. 
But, uh, but far more impressive than dog whisperers are mothers. Here you go. You ready for this? Mothers are the baby whisperers. Faith's doing a great job. She's a new mother, and, you know, you, you got everything under control over there. There's a baby. I said, Don't, that baby better not give me attitude during my sermon. But, <laughs> but uh, mothers are child whisperers. And uh, teenage whispers, that's a little more challenging though, right? And, uh, and uh, moms have to sometimes be husband whispers, but I'm not, let's not go there. Let's just skip that topic. Uh, it, when you read scripture, mothers have the high praise and admiration of God. The word of God affirms motherhood. We're going to come back to this idea in a couple of weeks in, in parenthood in general. But the Bible is very affirming of parents and of, of mothers in particular. And Proverbs 31 is a passage we're all familiar with. And it just lists all these wonderful, virtuous things that mothers do. Uh, She's strong and honorable. You know, these are some things you can think about with your mother. Uh, She knows just when to laugh and when not to laugh. She speaks wisdom and gives loving instruction. She watches over her household and is never idle. Her children and husband praise her. Mom's goodness surpasses that of everyone else. Mothers enhance the environment of the family by their life and the way they think and, and what they do and their attitudes. Like, you know, mother, there's like a, a salty, a, a healthy, wholesome influence. It's very powerful. There's no greater influence in a child than how the parents are at home. Uh, we can have a great youth program, a great children's ministry at Lakeside, and we do. But we can't always override if, you know, things are bad in a home. You know, the parents are the most powerful influencers there. So the Bible is very affirming when that influence is good. Now, as I thought about our inner life this morning, the inner life of a person, it dawned on me that one of the ways that we can think of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is a kind of human whisperer, okay? Uh, the, the, the word for God's Holy Spirit in the Bible is wind or breath. And so Jesus said the Holy Spirit is like wind. And it blows into a person's life and, and it blows wherever it will. And when the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, we can feel the Spirit's effect. We can sense it. Even though we can't see God visibly, physically, God's spirit can be felt. And its effect, its imprint on us is very distinguishable. You can tell when you're with a spiritual person versus, and by spiritual, I don't mean spiritual in a generic cultural sense. Uh, In in the New Testament, the word spiritual means spirit-led, that you're in a relationship with the Father through the Son and you have the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit puts an imprint on your life. And it's very distinctive. And you can see that spiritual influence in a person as you're interacting with them. It's very evident. Uh, I, I can tell like if we're eating out and the waitress or the waiter. You know, I can tell if I meet somebody new. You know, the bond. There's something about a, a person led by the Spirit. It's very distinctive. And we're going to talk about that this morning. But isn't it interesting how a mother or a father's human spirit can have such a profound effect on the family. But then when you're part of the family of God, God the Father, his Holy Spirit, can have an overriding, very powerful effect on our lives. And so at the end of the Gospel of John, uh, there's this moment in John 20, 22, when Jesus, he, uh, he says, my peace be with you. He says that in John 20, 21. But then it says in John 20, 22, that he breathes on his disciples and he gives them this invitation. He says, receive my Holy Spirit. You know, it's, it's like some serious, hardcore human whispering going on here. He, he says, I want to give you peace. He breathes on him. He says, receive my spirit. He's, he's giving them his spirit. He barely uses any words. He just breathes. And so by God's Holy Spirit, uh, a relationship with this Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit isn't it. A Holy Spirit, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is someone with whom you have a relationship with as a believer. And the Holy Spirit can bring peace into a very chaotic person's life. 
all of that inner turmoil of the Holy Spirit can calm that and bring peace and strength and in a very distinctive, if not unimaginable way. By his spirit, God can do things for us that even mom can't do or dad or anyone else. Now, this may surprise many religious people uh, because when you're religious, often your religion is spelled D-O. It's all about what you do and your effort and try harder and, you know, uh, carrots and sticks. You know, you get carrots when you do good. You get the, the, the stick across the knuckles or whatever when you do bad. Or what, like, that's religion, right? But that's not the picture of how God wants our relationship with him by his Holy Spirit to work. Uh, this isn't a life that is powered by, you know, the flesh and by human strength. It's not like you go to the gym in the same way you go to church and it's a parallel. Sit. No, this life is completely different. And so the repeated refrain, you can go through the entire Old Testament and God's spirit is at work in the Old Testament. And the repeated refrain in the Old Testament by the prophets was that it's not going to be by power or by might, but it's going to be by my spirit, says the Lord. So one of the big ideas I want to establish in your mind is that we get transformed by inviting the presence and power of God's Holy Spirit to affect a change in us. He can do things to us and transform us in a way that you can't just do overtly by your own will or your own strength or your own power. You, we're inviting the Holy Spirit to change us and to sanctify us. And the reason he's called the Holy Spirit is because he makes us holy. His spirit makes us holy. Now, there's other spirits that work in the world. And there's the spirit of this age and this culture. And it's a very corrupting spirit. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks when we talk about the family. But God's Holy Spirit makes us holy and it has a holy effect on us, a redemptive, resetting, refreshing, life-giving effect. And so God said from the very beginning, it's not new, that he's going to do something by his spirit that we can't do for ourselves. In Galatians uh, chapter 3, verse 3, when Paul's talking to the church at Galatia, you know, Paul was the church whisperer. You know, you'd have this church and, and everybody would be fighting and backbiting. There'd be conflicts and fleshliness and worldliness and like everything would be. And Paul would write these letters and he would just take the church and kind of. But one of the things he said to the church at Galatia, which had a lot of trouble with legalism and religion and all that. He said, are you so foolish? Like you're missing that after beginning with the spirit, now you're trying to achieve your goal by the, by, by, by the flesh. And he's like, come back to the spirit and walk in the spirit and, and, and come about this life with the means that God enabled. If you try to become like God in the flesh, you're going to be very frustrated and disillusioned. You can't master your flesh of your own will. You need God's spirit to subdue and to conquer and to, to, to quell your rebellion in your spirit before God. The spirit has to do the work, but we can invite the spirit in. So God intends us to live this new life by his indwelling power. One of the questions that you're probably thinking is, okay, how do I get the Holy Spirit? How do I get the gift of the Holy Spirit? Like, how do I get this relationship that you're talking about? And some of you have never even heard a message on the Holy Spirit. And it's like, what, what, where's this all coming from? This is all new. Uh, how do you receive the Holy Spirit? There's a lot of different passages I could point to. One passage is Ephesians 1.13. It talks about how in Jesus, uh, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. This isn't a new development. Promised Holy Spirit, the prophets were talking about it. You know, it goes all the way back. But you were sealed with the Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, Jesus, and when you believe. Now, I just take the Bible at face value. You receive the Holy Spirit when you hear the good news of Jesus. So we spent the whole year going through the good news of Jesus, going through the Gospel of John. We laid that foundation, and many of you believed on Jesus for the first time, and we had baptisms. And so when you hear that Gospel, and when you believe, you trust that message, Jesus says, I'm life and, and, okay, Jesus, I trust you for life. The, the Holy Spirit is God's gift to you. 
for this life that he wants you to live. Uh, Acts 2.38, Peter is preaching Christ to the people that just crucified Jesus on the cross. And the people, they hear the gospel, they realize that Jesus was God's plan for the forgiveness of sin and the redemption of the world for salvation, and they hear this message, they realize what had just happened and, and that they were part of the crowds that chanted crucify him, and they're like, what should we do? And Peter says, this is an apostle now, repent and be baptized, each of you, that's like individually, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So there's passages all over the New Testament that kind of establish a pattern that you, yes, hear the gospel, you believe in the gospel, you repent and turn back to God, which means you're saying, more God, more God, I need more of you and, and less flesh, less worldliness, less spirit of this age. I need you, God, to reset. That's repentance. And baptism, uh, baptism is an invitation. God, forgive my sin. Wash away my sin. And uh, so you get baptized. So Acts 2 uh, echoes something that Jesus told Nicodemus. So Nicodemus, he asked Jesus, he goes, what, what do I need to do to enter the kingdom of God? If I accept who you are, what do I need to do? What's my response? And, and Jesus told Nicodemus, he says, Truly I tell you, unless someone's born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So there again, you have baptism, water, and you have Spirit. And when you yield your life, you're baptized. God washes away your sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. And he gives you his Spirit. You know, when a baby's born, it passes through water. It's born out of darkness into the light, passes through water, and the first act of the child is to breathe and to take in breath. And that's a picture of, that Jesus establishes of what we do. You know, we, we hear the gospel, we respond, we go through the water, we die to our sin, we're raised to new life, and God washes away our sin, but the first act of the Christian life is to breathe. It's a picture of salvation. You must be born again. And uh, how many of you heard that phrase before, born again? It used to, I don't hear it as much anymore because if you say born again, then it's kind of almost like you're identifying with something politically or whatever. That's how, how uh, politicized everything's gotten. But the phrase born again, if we could like redeem its meaning and whatnot, it's a great phrase. And if ever there were like an invitation to reset again, it's Jesus' invitation, be born again. You want to reset in your life, go down into the waters of baptistry and invite Jesus to wash away all of your sin. Repent. Say goodbye to your past. Not that your past is insignificant. Not that it didn't matter. But... It can't determine your future. And how do you move forward if you're being weighted down by the past? By the forgiveness of Jesus. You need to be forgiven. Uh, and there's people that you need to forgive. And when you are, are making that decision to be baptized, you're saying, wash my sins away. And I'm releasing others from, from their sins as I've been released from mine. And you're set free to live this new life. And you're forgiven. And, and that's the power of what baptism can be for us. So no more excuses, no more narratives, sad stories, justifications. Not that they weren't true, but your hurts or I was abandoned or I was tormented or someone ran over my tail with a hot wheel, whatever it was, you know. By his grace, God is offering us a reset. Be forgiven, but more than that, peace be with you. Jesus breathes on us and he says, receive this Holy Spirit. And then God simultaneously baptizes us with his Holy Spirit, and so we're forgiven. The water symbolizes his blood washing away our sins. Then we come up out of the water, we breathe in the Spirit, and God's Spirit does things for us that we couldn't do prior. He sets us free from sin. He sanctifies us, which means he makes us holy. There's this effect spiritually that now God's Spirit is dwelling within and, and breathing within and and. It, our life is being animated as Christian people 
of faith differently than someone who's not of faith that doesn't have that spirit, maybe has the spirit of the age. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is central in the disciples' life. They are physically following Jesus. They're physically listening to him teach, and they're physically identifying with him, right? And they're being taught and led by him. But when Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, after he died, he was buried, he was raised, he ascended to the right hand of the Father, Jesus said that he would relate to us going forward by his spirit. And he said, wait for my Holy Spirit to come. Like, you're not going to get anywhere that I want you to go. You have to wait for my Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit becomes central in the Christian's life uh, in the later New Testament, in Acts, in all the following, all the way up into the present and into the future. Now, here's how, uh, here's an invitation that I'll give you. I'm just going to talk about something in kind of a summary form for a couple of minutes. But some of you, if you've never heard or looked at what the Bible says about your relationship with the Holy Spirit, if you're in a place that you want to dig into this and go a little deeper, you can always come in and talk to me. I'd be happy to walk you through the scriptures if you want to do that. But you can go online, and I'm going to summarize some things. But in my notes online, you can look at all the scriptures. Because I'm going to summarize. I just want to give you a flavor for the scope of activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's what I want to do this morning. But you can dig in and look at the many scriptures that reinforce. It's going to, you can just hover your mouse over all the, and you can just read it. And you're going to be amazed. And, uh, and, and some of this content that I want to share with you, some of the summary is, is stuff we do in our disciple training uh, here at Lakeside. Because your relationship with Jesus, forgiveness, your relationship with the Holy Spirit, sanctification, right? Your relationship with the body, you're no longer alone. You have a family, a new family that you can be redeemed through your relationship with the world. We talk about all that in our disciple training. But the Holy Spirit, your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Uh, you're, think, of, think of a car. In a car, uh, once you you got things in gear, right, you believe, you know, you got the, the core stuff figured out, you got the car started, the engine can, right. Gas pedal. You can accelerate into your relationship with the Holy Spirit. And the New Testament tells us all these commandments and of how we accelerate into a relationship with the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to give you some examples. Be immersed in the Holy Spirit. We're baptized into one spirit and into one body, the church, regardless of Jews, Greeks, slave, free, male, female. Like, regardless of worldly distinctions, we get immersed into, like, one body and into one spirit. It's a very powerful picture of how God washes away the world's categories, and he establishes a new humanity by his spirit. And so be immersed into the spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't get drunk on wine, which has its own influence as you get drunk on wine. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. Drink in the spirit is repeatedly, like that's the idea of it. Uh, sow to the spirit. You've heard the phrase, you reap what you sow. Some people sow to the spirit. Uh, I'm sorry, some people sow to the flesh, they, they sow to their sinful nature, they sow to their anger, they sow to their bitterness, they, they, they sow to division. And when you do that, whatever you sow, you get a multiple, a multiple of that. Maybe in your family as an adult, you've been, as a parent, maybe you've been sowing the wrong kinds of seeds into your family. And then you realize, oh, this is the kind of marriage I have, but it's because of 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 years of sowing a certain kind of seed. Now I don't really like the fruit of it. Or here's my children, and at even a young age, now they're starting to mimic things that, like, I don't want those to be the seeds that I sow. So what do you do? You sow to the Spirit. You sow something different. And don't be discouraged. It's not too late for you to sow a whole new kind of life into your marriage and your family. We'll come back to that in a few weeks, but I'm just giving you an invitation to stay around, not just on Mother's Day, but enjoy the series. You know, let's go on a journey and talk about this stuff. Drink in the Spirit. Uh... Jesus said, if anyone's thirsty, if anyone, it's not an exclusive club here at Lakeside or in the body of Christ. Some get the Holy Spirit and the rest, nope, no matter what. If anyone is thirsty for the Holy Spirit's work in their life, then come and drink. Whoever believes in me, Jesus says, 
Streams of living water will flow from within him. If, if you have believed on Jesus, that Holy Spirit, those streams of water are starting to, that, that, that brook is starting to trickle, right? But we want to accelerate it. So drink it in. Don't just taste it. Drink in this new life. Keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Uh, produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Tell me uh, what you think of this. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. When the, I, I, I told you how the Holy Spirit has an imprint on people's life. When you invite the Holy Spirit, like he produces the fruit. And he produces fruit that, like you might be able to fake some of these things for a little while. Like you can fake love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But the moment something bad happens, I mean, you reset and, you know, you're impulsive and you're nasty. And like, you can't fake the Holy Spirit fruit. You can do it for a moment. But you can't do it day in and day out. And the fruit of the Spirit, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. We're talking about a whole new wiring for you, your marriage, your family, your life. The Holy Spirit what, what would you tell somebody if they said, hey, how, how do I become more patient? And how do I become more joyful? And, you know, you say, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, go see a therapist. Uh, go get con- take a drug. Uh, you know, uh, go buy a new home. Or like, what would your prescription be? Was, Our prescription is you need a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You need a new spirit. You need something from the inside that transforms you to the outside, not something external that you hope will translate into the internal space of your life. Keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Produce the fruit. Be on fire in the Spirit. So never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor going and serving the Lord. Man, it was hard to keep our spiritual fervor going over the last year or two, wasn't it? You're divided, you're separated, you're demoralized, you're discouraged, there's sickness, there's like fear, there's war. I mean, like, keep your spiritual fervor going. You know, when you take individual embers and you separate them, they grow colder. How many of you grow colder over the COVID? COVID made a lot of people grow colder because you were isolated and separate. But now look at look around you. Like, the embers are gathered into a fire. So how do you stoke heat and fire? You put all those embers together, and pretty soon now you got now you got fire. You got something to talk about, right? So you can do things very tangible to accelerate and hit the gas and accelerate into this life of the spirit, which is very transformative and powerful. You can also hit the brake and brake check the Holy Spirit, which he doesn't enjoy too much. So you can become lukewarm, where people are like, you know, I, I can't discern if they're spirit-led by God's spirit or if they're worldly and led by the spirit of the saints. I just, like, they're kind of, like, I don't know. And, and when you're lukewarm, you know, God doesn't know. He's like, you know, he spews you out of his mouth in Revelation. Not a good picture, but you can insult the Holy Spirit. Like, when God gives you grace and dies on a cross for you and sends his one and only son and you trample on that cross... And you mock the gospel or, or just say, I don't care. Like, when God gives you his best and you mock that, like, how much more severely do you think you're going to be judged, right? You just insulted the spirit of grace. You don't want to do that. That's more than brake checking. That's like, you know, locking up the thing and walking away from your car. You can quench the spirit. So here's this fire, and then we can quench it. You know, by not gathering together. We can quench it by not ever taking up these spiritual words and, and letting us hear holy words as opposed to all the other words that, you know, are corrupting that we hear all week long and that we entertain ourselves with. Like, you can quench the spirit. You can reject the spirit. And so, like, here I am, I'm preaching. And if you reject what you're hearing, you know, the reason that I use the word of God is because who cares what John Morissette thinks? And who cares what you think, by the way? But... You have to consider what God says. And if you're using the word of God and you're holding out the word of God to people and they reject it, they're not rejecting me. You're not rejecting me or another person. You're rejecting God. And, and, and worse, you're rejecting his spirit and what God wants to do in your life. And, and that's a real problem for you if that's your attitude. So you can reject the spirit, quench him, insult him. Uh, you can lie to the spirit. So self-deception, God shows you something, but you believe something 
antithetical to what he shows you. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. This is a relationship. You can't grieve a, a, an energy or force or whatever. Like the Holy Spirit is a person who is talking to you in your conscience, in your inner being, and showing you things. And when you sin or I sin, he's grieved, just like you. You don't want to grieve your mother. You, know, you don't want to grieve your father. You don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And there's blasphemy of the Spirit, where you speak against the Spirit. Your conscience can become seared, where uh, literally the, uh, your sensitivity to the Spirit, uh, you know, the nerve endings in your finger can become seared and burn, and then you can no longer, you're no longer sensitive to, to hot or cold or sharp or dull. And we can become like that spiritually, where when we resist the Holy Spirit so long, like nothing gets through. And we're just hardened. And it's like a shell that can't be cracked. And the Bible says, you better be careful that when God's Holy Spirit is trying to tenderize you and you're resisting and you're getting harder, like it's going to get harder and harder for even God. If God can't get through to you, how's a preacher or your mom or dad or anybody else going to get through to you? You know, so like you don't want to sear your conscience. And, you know, there's a verse in Hebrews that talks about once you've tasted the heavenly gift and You've shared in the Holy Spirit and you've tasted the goodness of God's word and the power of this new life. Like, if you fall away from that, how could you be brought back again? Like, what other sermon is left to preach to you if you've rejected that? So, you can hit the brake, slam on the brakes, you can crash into a tree in your spiritual journey. And what God wants us to do is to, to keep an open inner posture. Now, I don't have time to unpack the scriptures, but I'm going to summarize some things, and i got to go fast. If we keep in step with the Holy Spirit, there is an incredible transformation that comes to us. So uh, sometimes a, a mom gets frustrated because they don't feel like their spirit is having the effect on the spirit of their family or on their kids. How many times as a parent do you feel like, man, I need reinforcements. I need someone to have my back. Well, the Holy Spirit has your back, and the Holy Spirit really is the leader. And, uh, and there's this incredible relationship. There's a dear professor of mine at LCU uh, named Dr. John Castling, and I was sitting in class one day, or, and, and he was talking about how a good way to understand the Holy Spirit is that he's a mentor, a tutor in your life. He's, he's a helper, he's a teacher, but he's also like a personal this is not a coach, a mentor. You know, there's a, a deeper dimension to it. And with every step of surrender that we take, this Holy Spirit does these profound things. For example, and again, if you want to read the scriptures, go online later. But here's some things for you to think about. The, the Holy Spirit guides our thoughts and knowledge and wisdom, our insight into situations. We think differently than the world thinks. Don't let that be an identity crisis for us. It's because you have a spiritual mind that the Holy Spirit's cultivated, and you just think differently, antithetically to the way people. I, I listen to stuff. I'm like, how do you get that backwards and warped in the way you look at something? John, you're a spiritual man. You've been reading the Word. The Spirit has given you knowledge and wisdom that's different than what people subscribe to. The Holy Spirit guides our feelings and emotions and attitudes. Isn't it hard to change an attitude or an emotion or the way you feel about something? It's like, that seems so hardcore in our wiring. Like, how do you undo that one? I think and feel and have different attitudes today than I've ever had at any point in my life. And the only thing that I can attribute it to is that the Holy Spirit has given me a new attitude. It's re <laughs> I feel differently. I, I feel differently toward people. Uh, and it's because of the Holy Spirit. And uh, my parents preached at me, but the Holy Spirit changed me, right, in my attitude. You, anybody getting any attitude these days from your kids, your family? You know, if, you know. The Holy Spirit guides our plans and actions. He sets a new agenda for us in our life. Everybody else, think of the agenda that everybody that you know out in the world has. But then there's a spiritual agenda that God gives us by his spirit. He guides us in holy living and character and, and achieves changes in us that laws can't bring about. 
He allows us to be self-governed by his spirit. It's powerful stuff. He guides us in leadership. Uh, when we speak on God's behalf, he gives us words. Like when you're sharing Jesus, you're like, oh, why would I get into that situation? I don't know what to say. The spirit shows up and gives you words. He gives you power in your ability to speak and explain. And I'm a bumbling idiot, but when I preach the word of God, I sound sem- semi-coherent, unless you're all faking it, you know. But anyway, artistic abilities. There's a whole realm of things that God can unlock in you, even ability-wise, music, arts, by his spirit. God guides us by his spirit in how to really act with love and justice toward the needy. The world throws money at people, but God shows us how we can really teach a person to depend on God and to really, truly help them at a deeper level in their need. He uh, guides us in prayers. He destroys strongholds around us through spiritual warfare. The Holy Spirit can decimate things that hold us in sin that we can't do. Missions, evangelism, worship, the unity of the church, what God builds by his spirit. And you know, on and on it goes. You can go online and look at some of this stuff if you're interested in it. I hope you are. If you want to do some investigation, some study, do some heavy lifting, get into the spiritual gym. But I wanted to say on this Mother's Day, God's spirit is the real human whisperer that we need to key into. And that relationship is so powerful and transformative. And, and won't you believe on Jesus and, and receive his forgiveness and washing and his baptism and, and let the spirit do for you maybe something that you haven't done. Hit reset in your relationship with the Holy Spirit or maybe begin it for the first time this morning. Uh, so if you're interested in this, after the service, there's a couple tables in the back. We have some, uh, some leaders in our church. You can start a conversation about what it looks like to believe in Jesus. And, like, we want to help you with this relationship. So that's the invitation this morning as we uh, uh, conclude our uh, Mother's Day service uh, in a little bit. Let's pray. Dear Father, uh, we know that uh, your spirit's so powerful and effective and we want to have that relationship with your spirit. We want to be transformed. We want to reset. We want renewal, sanctification by your spirit. And there's more to that relationship than they could ever be explained in a sermon, especially a 30-minute sermon. But we pray that you would teach us and walk with us into this new relationship. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
please be seated. We'll be responding uh, to the word, and we'll be celebrating communion. We'll do so as we engage Psalm 51 and Psalm 23 over the next little bit. So we're going to allow those passages to to guide us as we continue to worship. In a few moments, we'll we'll be singing. And as we sing, you're invited to make your way to one of the three stations, one in front, one in each corner. And at the stations, you're invited to to take the communion elements. The elements are, um, the bread and the juice are there, and that includes a gluten-free option. And while you're at the station, we just invite you to to eat the the bread and drink the cup and then return back to your seat and continue to sing and continue to worship. King David in Psalm 51 gives voice to our confession and our need for a savior. We're going to read it together responsibly. I'll begin and then I'll ask that you follow and read along the bold yellow text. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your willing spirit. In communion, we're relying upon the mercy of God through the Savior Jesus Christ. By eating the bread, we're participating in his body. And by drinking the cup, we're declaring the forgiveness that we have because of him. Let's rejoice and give thanks to God for the mercy that he's shown and for what he has done through Christ as we stand and we sing and we celebrate this table together. i 
invite you to join me. We're uh, together going to read aloud the 23rd Psalm as we continue our time to worship uh, here this morning. Let's read this together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When
Please be seated. Thank you for being here and worshiping with us at Lakeside today. I want to share some exciting news. Uh, today, we are celebrating the baptism of Kaiden Thompson, who was baptized this morning during the service back in our, our elementary kids area. So let's celebrate that together. We rejoice with Kaiden and his family and, and all of heaven as, uh, as he makes that decision to, to devote his life to Christ this morning. That's a great a great place to be, a great thing to celebrate. If you're new to Lakeside, we would love for you to join us for our starting point meal on May 22nd. Now, we'd love for you to sign up for that. You can do so at lakesidechristian.com slash events, and then stick around with us uh, right after our second service on the 22nd, and uh, enjoy lunch with, with the staff and get to know more about Lakeside. This morning, if you'd like to, to give, you can do so in, in several different ways, um, but the easiest way is uh, well, they're all listed right there, so you can, uh, you can pick your, your choice. But also, if you would like to give toward uh, the camp special offering, you can do that online or through dropping it in the uh, collection bucket tube cylinder. It's out there by the display. Uh, we are doing well with that collection, but we're excited to continue to, to collect the money so we can buy the pudding for the special dessert so the campers can love it all summer long. We'd encourage you uh, at some point to go to our, our events page on our website or to our Facebook page or Instagram to keep up with all the things that are going on. There's a lot happening here at Lakeside, and we don't want you to miss out on any of those things, so there are plenty of ways for you to keep up with, with that, and those are some of your options. As you leave this morning, ladies, please don't forget to stop by our information center and grab uh, a treat this morning as we are celebrating Mother's Day. Thank you for being here this morning, and go in peace. <laughs>